The agenda this week examined ongoing privacy concerns for a proposed high-tech neighborhood, considered the calculus of saving endangered species, and reflected on the politics of resentment with Francis Fukuyama. The agenda's week in review begins with a look at the municipal elections held this week in Ontario. What Dominion Voting says is voters in approximately 51 Ontario municipalities using Dominion's internet voting portal experienced slow traffic into the system. This load issue was determined to be the result of a Toronto-based server placing an unauthorized limit on incoming voting traffic that was roughly one-tenth of the system's designated bandwidth. Our company was unaware of this issue until our municipal customers and their voters reached out to us for assistance or to share complaints. That's the official explanation. John, did it have an impact in your part of the province? It didn't very much. Uh, Thunder Bay had some delay, uh, but that was mostly due to surnames and given names being confused uh, between the, the interface between the local software and the, and the mothership, if you will. Um, Ignace uh, went until about 2 o'clock in the morning last night before they had results, but there wasn't electronic voting there. Uh, there were 17 candidates, and all of those ballots were counted by hand. David, you spoke to a professor at Queen's University today who had some feedback on this issue. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, so I spoke to Kathy Brock. She's a professor here at Queen's University's School of Policy Studies. And, you know, she acknowledged that uh, these online voting problems were significant. Uh, if it were, in fact, 51 of 444 municipalities that had problems, you know, that's that's a problem. Uh, but she, you know, suggested that maybe it's too soon to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, as it were. Uh, you know, we've just come too far uh, with online voting and, you know, it's clearly going to be the, the, the choice uh, for the next generation of voters. They, they want to do things online. So moving away from that uh, would probably be short-sighted. And she said, you know, it's already, you can already see its benefits on, on democracy. You know, you, it's, cheaper for municipalities not to have polls open and it's you know it's easier for constituents to vote and if you know whatever whatever ways of, of getting that voter turnout uh, increased is good for municipalities. Mary anything in southwestern Ontario you want to bring our attention to? Well, actually, Steve, uh, most of Gray County municipalities, most of Bruce County municipalities were affected. Uh, Cambridge was affected, but not to the same degree. They, they extended their, their uh, deadline to, I think, about 10 o'clock last night. Okay. Mary, while you've got the floor, I want to stay with you because you actually, right now, are in ground zero of one of the most interesting democratic experiments that was happening anywhere in the province of Ontario last night, and that is... People didn't just vote once for their choice of candidate. They had a ranked ballot, and they voted for their first choice, second choice, third choice, and all the way down for mayor and all the councillors. How did it work? Well, I don't think there's dancing in the streets today, but I, I think that there's uh, a lot of uh, satisfaction with how it went. Uh, uh, we have a new mayor after 16, no, sorry, 14 rounds of counting. It's Ed Holder, and he's a former Conservative MP, actually. Uh, and the, the, the city got out all of the 14, there's 14 wards that they had to count. They got the results out roughly around noon today for them. And then shortly afterwards came the, the uh, count for the, the mayor. So considering that it's a new system, it really went smoothly. That was one of the points that uh, Jerry McCartney, he's the, uh, uh, of the London Chamber of Commerce made, was just how smoothly it went. And he noted London is a really good place to test out these things because it's not really, uh, attached to a county, it's not attached to a larger um, urban area, and it's, but it's a city of a certain size that makes a really good test subject for this. Hmm. And of course the way it works is the, the lowest ranked candidate drops off the ballot. That candidate's votes are redistributed among the remaining candidates, which is why it took 14 rounds before Ed Holder finally got 50% plus 1% of the vote. Uh, the theory is that if you get the majority of the votes, you've got more legitimacy. Anyway, David, I want to go to you next because I gather the whole idea of rank balloting uh, was on the ballot in Kingston last night. What happened with that? 
so the uh, voters of Kingston uh, did vote for ranked balloting to be uh, the, the the way of voting in 2022. However, uh, in the in the small print in the in the lead up and in the decision to put this on the ballot, uh, the vote actually required 50 percent voter turnout, uh, and Kingston did not reach that. I think it'll probably end up being closer to 40. Uh, and, and what that means is that it's non-binding. So even though Kingston voted 60 to 40 in favor of, of ranked ballot voting, uh, it's not binding and it will go to, uh, to council. It's incredibly frustrating for me as somebody who calls Toronto home and works in technology for us to keep pretending that Alphabet and Google didn't understand what they were doing, especially when it comes to data, when they came to Toronto. So this whole thing about we are listening and responding, this is not their first rodeo. And it's not the first smart city that has been built in the world. So for us to keep talking to the fact that it's it is incredibly complex, but I, I think there are certain things that have to be table stakes, and that's part of the reason why I was frustrated, because we should know some of these things. There are assumptions coming into this model, even the proposal, what we want, that the public should know. And we should have had that discussion before a vendor was even selected. We should have had wide public consultations to figure out what we want to build. We picked who, wa who we want to build the thing first, and then we're like, oh, what are the requirements? What are we actually looking to build? Which is backwards. So it's backwards in your view. Anne. What I want to make clear is what attracted me to work on this is we wanted to differentiate the smart city built here in Toronto from all the other smart cities the rest of the world, Dubai, other places. I'm on the International Council for Smart Cities. And they are smart cities of surveillance. They track everything. You have no privacy. It is a surveillance exercise. What distinguish, what I was hoping would distinguish Toronto, we would be a smart city of privacy. We would address privacy right up front, which is why they contacted me, embed privacy by design, make sure that people's privacy is totally preserved, and then allow the data to be used in whatever ways and data governance issues will have to be addressed. But I wanted to lock down the privacy issue. And the only way you can do that is by de-identifying all information at source. And that's, I had a commitment about that from Sidewalk Labs at the beginning. So now I'm looking to Waterfront Toronto to put that commitment in writing so that they lay down the law. Anyone who works with them must do this up front so that we can have a smart city of privacy, not of surveillance. Can the organization that you used to chair give her that undertaking? I think they've already committed to privacy by design in the uh, uh, plan development agreement. So I think that commitment's been made. I think they've already committed in writing in that agreement to um, maximizing the de-identification and use of edge technologies, as, as I already said. It's it's written down in a contract. It's, it's, it's been walking signed. the talk, Mark. It's, that's the critical thing. Yeah, no, I, so, 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 so that that has been done, and and I think it's pretty clear that that's a that's a shared goal. So I, I think that's an opportunity that we'll we will absolutely move forward with. And I personally, as a member of the Digital Strategy Panel, will continue to advocate for that. So I, I and I have no question about that. Yeah, okay. but so, I just want to talk to, back to of Sadia, one of the, the comments she made, which was around and 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 I appreciate the point of view around you know should we have had all the requirements set in a big public consultation before we issued an RFP so that's one approach to in fact procurement and I would view that as a very traditional approach to procurement what Waterfront Toronto tried to do here, and in fact was pushed by the community many times to do, was to step up its game in innovation. And so it said, look, I, I want to search the world to find the best innovation partner. And then having found that person, we'll figure out what innovations will actually apply, and therefore what rules we'll need to govern those innovations. To do that in advance of actually knowing what the innovations might be, I don't think would have been the right process. Mark, okay. I don't want yeah. to conflate democratically informed processes but traditional. So we can't just leave behind things that we have put in place because they are thorough, because they provide a check and balance for power asymmetries. That's why those processes exist. Just because they've existed for a while does not mean that we chuck them because that's not what innovation is. Both you and I work in technology industry. We know, we know this shiny orbs thing that we do is like very first time we're going to revolutionize the world but some of the things that work work for a reason and i think that's why public trust has been so shaky from the get-go for this project because there was no investment on both waterfront and sidewalks part and sidewalk is a profit generating 
um, company. So they're doing what they're supposed to do. I'm looking to Waterfront as a steward for the residents of Toronto. There should have been public education and we should have had more meaningful conversations around what it is that the residents wanted to build. Do we even want the things that are being proposed? We don't know because nobody asked the public. Okay, let me get Bianca in here and then I'm going to come yeah, over so with another issue. Two points here. One of them to build off of the anti-democratic nature of this process is that whoever said anybody wanted all this data collected? That's an important step in this discussion. Mm -hmm. We, we, I didn't, but some parties here decided we'd accelerate into what we need to do to anonymize it or de-identify it, which is one track, absolutely part of the conversation. We have a whole other host of issues that we didn't talk about and that, frankly, as a global, it, it's a global conversation going on right now mm -hmm. about to what degree do we want our, our behaviors captured? To what, even if they're in aggregate, to what extent do we want those used and monetized in products? Um, how do we want to make good use of these things within the public service versus turning them into any sort of a commercial well, product? Let me do a quick follow-up on that. Would you yeah. acknowledge that, that many millennials nowadays are less fussed about some of those issues than perhaps people of Absolutely older generations? Not. No. Absolutely, so? not. No? Absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. No. And they're savvy because they're realizing how people are incorrectly framing these issues. The second part for me is building on this idea around you know, sidewalks of for-profit business, waterfront is the one we look to. To a degree, yes, mm -hmm. looking to waterfront, again, waterfront is not the government. We need mm -hmm. to be very clear about that. But there's also, after a year in business, the way someone does business with me matters. So I understand that they're here doing business, mm -hmm. but how they are doing business is something that I think as a city and as residents, we need to be paying attention to. Where do you see problems with the Species at Risk uh, Act and its approach to <clears throat> conservation? Well, there have been a number of uh, limitations, let's say, in terms of how the act itself has been implemented. Um, it's been very slow. Uh, we've seen over the now, I guess, 16 years that the act's been in place, um, that it's taken a long time in most instances um, for those species that are, are to actually become listed, uh, and then for the actions required for the recovery to actually be taken. Uh, and I think that's the greatest concern is that with a very slow implementation process, in some cases with not enough or insufficient uh, resourcing, um, then we, we can't take the necessary steps that those species require um, in terms of stopping the decline, but also bringing them back from the brink. And I'm, I'm, not, and I'm guessing in that 16 year span, um, a lot of money has been spent to do that. Sure, uh, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars are allocated towards uh, the Species at Risk Act and their programs by our federal government. Um, and so, you know, it is a significant investment, um, but that investment hasn't clearly been enough um, in terms of how we're also implementing the act, the strategies that we take. Um, I think we need to be looking at new approaches. And a new approach um, that has uh, some people excited and some people, um, I guess, having more questions uh, is one that you have, Tara. It's the priority threat management. Can you give us a definition of what that is? Yeah, so priority threat management is a decision-making tool, uh, which we developed to essentially identify the management strategies needed to save as many species as possible for the least economic cost. We do this by identifying the, the strategies. So those strategies might be everything from um, habitat protection, habitat restoration, managing inappropriate fire regimes. We identify those strategies. We estimate the benefit of those strategies in achieving the recovery of species. We estimate the economic cost of those strategies. And finally, we estimate the, the socioeconomic and technical uh, feasibility of those strategies. And together, that enables us to identify those combinations of actions which are going to save as many species as possible for the least cost. I want to read something else from that Global Mail article. Um, With fewer than 1,000 breeding pairs left in Canada, burring owls are listed among our most endangered species. In principle, Dr. Martin would like to save them. But in practice, she's advocating a new approach to conservation that admits a harsh fact. Saving burring owls, at least in this country, is likely beyond our means. Tara, what makes a burring owl too expensive to save? So I guess, firstly, it, it's not that the burrowing owl is too expensive to save. Uh, and there is a chance that we can save it in Canada. What our study showed was that it requires 
broad cooperation beyond Canada. This is a migratory species that moves through the US down to Mexico and back again. And without that cooperation between countries, the, there's very little chance that we could recover um, burrowing owl in Canada. And so what the study sh really revealed was that for some species, um, actions beyond Canada are necessary to save that species. Well, I want to add another voice to this conversation. Malini Goodchild from the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. Hi, Malini. Uh, it's nice to have you on the show. Hi, Nan. Thank you. Um, I know you've been listening to the conversation and um, how differently would traditional Indigenous knowledge look at conservation of species like the burrowing owl? I think, you know, the context for what we call Anishinaabe Gikandasuin or Indamawin, which is our worldview and our, our way of relating to the world, you know, we don't even have a separation of ourselves as human beings from nature, uh, from what we would call the ecosystem in Western science. And so in our creation stories, we were placed here alongside what we call our relatives. In uh, We say in Dinawamag and Induk. And so the burrowing owl and other species, as we would say in English, are actually relatives. And so the conversation is quite a bit different for us because it's talking about, you know, our clans, our, our relatives, medicine, sources of spirituality and culture for us. And so I think that it's actually a very complex, what seems like a simple equation, um, and certainly part of the toolkit for conservation uh, doesn't uh, necessarily include that perspective, and we might need to broaden it to include that perspective. I guess Donald Trump has, has certainly brought to the fore the notion that uh, there are some people who see themselves as Americans, as nationalists first and only, and then there are other people who are more global in their orientation. Uh, I guess some people who believe in the European Union, some people who are part of the, the Remain side in the United Kingdom. Um, I guess, you know, those of us who are from somewhere as opposed to those of us who are from anywhere. How, how useful is that right. as a way of looking at this thing? No, it's very useful. That was a distinction made by David Goodhart uh, uh, in, in a recent book where some people just have a more cosmopolitan outlook. Uh, they depend, they travel, they depend on foreign products and friends and so forth, and others are much more rooted in a single place, and that actually corresponds to a big class distinction. So the people in the anywhere category usually have a college education or higher. Uh, those that are rooted in one place, you know, tend to be uh, less educated. And that's a huge uh, uh, division in society. Uh, and both, you know, there, there, there are problems in, in both of those perspectives because I think the anywheres, the cosmopolitan anywheres tend to look down on the, the people that are rooted. Uh, they don't really appreciate uh, their perspectives and their problems. And it generates this incredible resentment, uh, which you saw then expressed in the Brexit vote and the vote for Trump uh, and the like. Here's another theme you raise in the book, and I'd like you to just amplify on this a bit uh, as well. You've suggested that universal dignity afforded through human rights is not sufficiently satisfying for many. Uh, why do you think? Well, so that's what a democracy does in theory, right? It says you're a citizen and therefore we grant you rights of speech, association, freedom of religion, you can vote, uh, and so forth. And I think if you live in an authoritarian country, those are really valuable. Right, so if you were living in Burma or Tunisia or Ukraine or you know a country that had uh, that really didn't allow people to participate, uh, that's something very precious. But you know, once you get it, uh, you start thinking to yourself, okay, well, of course I'm treated this way, but I want something more. You know, I I'm a member of a group that's not being respected uh, because of my gender, because of my you know ethnic background. Uh, because of the region in which I live, and so you begin to demand other more particular forms of, of recognition. For example, in Eastern Europe, the generation that lived under communism, I think, you know, felt in, intensely that they wanted these universal equal rights uh, that a democracy provides, but virtually, you know, great majority of the people living in those countries now, Poland, Hungary, and so forth, were born after the collapse of communism. They have no uh, personal experience of that kind of dictatorship and 
they can think to themselves, well, the real problem, you know, that's oppressing me is the European Union, it's Brussels. Uh, and they don't really have a point of comparison like their parents did uh, that would, you know, allow them to appreciate that universal form of uh, citizenship rather than these particular forms of, of recognition that they're seeking. In which case, if this is the muck we now find ourselves in, let's go to what we can do to get ourselves out of this muck. And you have put forward some ideas in the book. Uh, for example, immigration reform, civics education, and national service. If, if those three things, which have been, well, immigration reform in particular, absolutely intractable in the United States uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, but, but if somehow you were able to wave a magic wand and make these three things happen, what would be the value of doing it? Well, all of them, I think, uh, solve mm. different kinds of problems. Immigration reform, you know, opposition to immigration is actually what's driving people to vote for these populist parties, both in the United States and in Europe. I think, actually, frankly, if we had something more like a Canadian uh, skill-based immigration policy and better enforcement, it would take the wind out of the sails of a lot of the anti-immigration groups uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, national service, I think, is important because in a democracy, uh, people don't just have rights. It's not just a matter of the government giving you stuff. I think people have to be made aware that uh, they have to be active participants in a, in a democratic uh, community. And then I think the idea of national identity you know, the, the civics is, is, a, is just a means to the end of creating a, a sense of national identity, which has to be a creedal, open one. It has to be uh, one that it can accommodate a de facto multicultural society, but yet give people something in common to believe in, which I think has to do with democratic political institutions, belief in fundamental equality. So I think if you combine all of those and you have the right kind of leadership to push them, I think it would push back against this you know, this fractionalizing uh, identity politics on both the right and the left that we've uh, experienced in, in recent years. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review for this Friday, October 26th, 2018. You can see all of those conversations in their entirety at TVO.org, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, and on our Twitter feed at twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.